Well, let's get things underway. So I, I'm fascinated by culture. I want to know what the culture of this school, St. Paul's at Bald Hills, was like when you arrived. Yeah, when I arrived, it was really quite strange. You know, I, I had come from a school in Canberra where I was the founding principal uh, and real privilege of actually starting a culture from the ground up. So when I started, there were just two staff. When I left, we had you know, 1,000 kids about to open a second campus, well over 150 staff. Uh, so I was able to shape a culture which reflected who I was and what I actually valued. Uh, I was really keen to move to a place which was an existing school, uh, an older school that had an existing culture because I was really fascinated in culture and fascinated in leadership as well and, and what could I do as the leader of the organisation to shape culture. Uh, when I arrived here I was quite struck by uh, the differences between where I'd come from uh, and this place here. And it wasn't until I started digging a bit deeper to understand what had actually gone on to cause the culture and the things that I was seeing. Uh, and as I reflected on that, what I, what I was seeing was an absence of trust. Uh, trust was really absent within this organisation and it played out in all sorts of different ways. You know, the way the buildings were actually designed, the physical barriers placed between people, uh, areas where high confidential documents were kept, confidential photocopier where people weren't allowed to go in and use that photocopier uh, to the way that people worked so there was no collaboration between people uh, and even the relationships between students and teachers was really strange there wasn't that normal sort of relationship you would see in a great school it was very strained and very different so there were these rules that were that became walls yeah. psychological and real it definitely. So this building that we sit in at the moment was designed by my predecessor uh, and you know, it was built in 2007, the year before I arrived. Uh, and this building had its own set of unwritten rules but also written rules as well about who could enter in the front door, who couldn't enter the front door, who could use the main stairs, who couldn't use the main stairs. There were doors and barriers. This office here, uh, well, at my office, there was three receptionists to uh, go through to actually get to see me. Uh, and I was used to working on the ground floor and uh, having my window looking into the playground and people just passing by the office door and saying hi and dropping in and saying hello. Whereas when I came here, you had to go through three guardians, really, to actually get to see me, which I, I found really confronting and really difficult. Did anyone warn you or tell you when you were going through the interview process or just after you arrived Paul Browning, you don't know what you've walked into? Not really. I knew there were issues. Uh, the previous principal's contract wasn't renewed uh, and they were moved on. Uh, there were issues around the financial management of the organisation. Uh, so I, I was made aware of the finances and, uh, and actually spent a lot of time having a look at those before I accepted the job as well. I did a little bit of Googling and looking at the history of the school and the organisation as well and I understood that there had been abuse that had occurred here in the 80s and the 90s uh, and the school had been wanting in, in those periods. Uh, but beyond that I wasn't really cognizant with the impact that that would have had on the culture of the organisation. So in the recruitment process or when I assume you had a three-person panel in the oh, final stages. Than that. <laughs> more than, did they say, Paul, we've had a problem at this school and we want you to uh, find some way of addressing it or fixing it? I don't think they really knew. The interview process was actually quite interesting. It was a five interview process. So panels, individuals, you know, five interviews to, to get to this point. It took three months to go through the process. So it was a very arduous uh, process. So it was very thorough and well done. Certainly, as I said, I was, you know, I was told that there were some financial issues in terms of not mismanagement, but you know, the, the way the accounts were actually reported. There had been a couple of uh, qualified audits that had occurred. Um, so that sort of leads all sorts of questions as well. Uh, there were some comments about uh, the style of leadership that I was following, uh, but you know, as I, said, I don't think the people who were recruiting me really understood necessarily the impact that those previous heads had had on the organisation, but more importantly, what had happened in terms of the abuse and the impact that that had on the way people actually worked and, and the way people responded to it. You start in the job, you find these invisible walls, you see that something is problematic in the culture, and at a certain point, it becomes very clear what that is, where the school that you've been given limited information about us, how I read it, is named in the Royal Commission into institutional responses into 
child sexual abuse. So when that becomes fully realised and your school is named and you are the leader, the head of that school, what went through your mind? It was a bit terrifying, confronting. Uh, I kind of guessed that we might have been a, a case study at the Royal Commission. So when I arrived, as I said, I, I, was, I was almost immediately confronted with an oddity of the way people actually worked. So I knew something was wrong and as I scratched beneath the surface and I talked to people and I listened to them, I spent the first three months going around the school visiting people where they worked uh, and asking them to tell me what they loved about the place, what they didn't like about the place. Very quickly I understood that uh, people really didn't like the culture. You know, they didn't like the fact that they weren't trusted to do their jobs uh, and what they were looking for was a leader that they could trust and yeah, you know, me, I, I've, I was used to being trusted by a staff and so coming here and people then questioning my motives and who I was was really quite confronting and difficult. So I spent a lot of time reflecting on you know, what can I do to turn that around. In the interim, uh, because of the history of the school, probably a victim every couple of months would come forward. Uh, and the process at that time is that they would probably reach out to the school or the church uh, and then there was a process behind the scenes with the diocese that they went through to receive compensation uh, and support for, for the crimes that were committed against them. So I knew that was going on but I never really had the opportunity to meet with a victim. When the Royal Commission came along in 2013 we were named as a case study. And so for two years prior to the, the public hearing, we were committed to collecting evidence to supply to the Royal Commission. And so two years work, over 100,000 pieces of evidence was collected from here because of the extent of the abuse and given to the Royal Commission. So an extraordinary amount of work uh, behind the scenes to actually do that. So my whole focus really shifted from running a school to preparing for a public hearing. Uh, leading up to the public hearing, you know, the staff were on edge they had been through hearings before. This wasn't the first time St Paul's was the, uh, the focus of, a, of, of an inquiry into what had happened. There had been an inquiry in 2001 and finished in 2003. People thought it was over and here it is again you know, in the public uh, realm once, one more time. So, My name's Steve Austin. I'm interviewing Dr Paul Browning about his book published by University of Queensland Press. It's called Principled, 10 Leadership Practices for Building Trust. I want to take a brief pause at this time and ask you, what's the difference between having power and being a leader? My reading of you is that there's a very real difference between having power but actually showing leadership. It's a really good story and I can't remember his name. Uh, it's a story of a guy who uh, was a very high level CEO in New York in the 90s. Um, very successful uh, headhunting company. So recruitment company, he, his job was to recruit CEOs. Uh, and all of a sudden in the 90s, obviously there were some recessions in Australia that were occurring. Uh, there was a huge downturn in business, uh, significant downturn in business. Um, and he was faced with, I guess what was faced with lots of companies now through this, this pandemic is, do you put those staff off uh, or what do you actually do? So he went to his staff at that time and actually said to them, look, this is the situation, we've got a downturn, I'm asking you all to take a 10% pay cut so we can save everybody's jobs. Uh, remarkably, people said yes we'll do that but what they didn't know and what they didn't find out until he actually passed away is that that year he decided not to take any pay himself at all so he didn't tell anybody that he forwent any pay himself to save the company and save people's jobs uh, it was a, a remarkable story in terms of his understanding of what leadership is actually all about. You know, a lot of people get confused that leadership is about a position and when you've got a position you're in a position of power uh, and you can control and it's your decisions and in a sense you need to be the expert of all things and people are looking to you to be that expert. That's not what leadership is all about. Leadership uh, is about service. It's about giving of yourself to empower others to be remarkable people. Uh, so supporting them uh, to become uh, people that they were designed to be. So this is one of the themes in your book, Principle, that leadership is actually service. In other words, you've taken sort of the normal corporate structure, if you like, uh, and turned it on its head. You've tipped, it, you've tipped the pyramid upside down. 
organisations will fail if they get caught up in that sort of under, or thought or sort of construct that leadership is about power and position. Uh, because ultimately what happens then is everyone looks to that single person to be the font of all knowledge, the expertise, and, and they need to be infallible. And in actual fact, none of us are perfect. We will all make mistakes. And an organisation will be only as good as the people you draw wisdom from. So great leaders uh, build teams around them uh, and employ people better than them. Uh, and then empower them to do their jobs. Great organisations are able to innovate and, and create new ideas and really thrive when they draw on the expertise of all the people in their organisation. So creating a culture where everyone's trusted, uh, then people are willing to contribute ideas, to have a go at things, to take risks, uh, and all of a sudden you see an organisation fl uh, flourish and do amazing things. But if you rely on that one person, because they seem to think that they're, they're the best, uh, they're the ones who are appointed to that position and therefore they've got to be the saviour or the hero of the company, they're only going to be as good as that one person. So you're telling me that a leader's real talent, role or responsibility is to actually set the culture, not run the, not run the rules or define the rules? I would argue from my experience of being you know, essentially a CEO of two large independent schools for over 20 years that the and reflecting over that period of what leadership's all about, I would argue that leadership boils down to two simple things. Uh, one, casting a compelling vision. So casting a vision of what you'd like your organisation to actually be, uh, what it's not currently, and seeing into the future what you'd like it to become, and then building a culture of trust that enables people to achieve that vision uh, and go on that journey to actually create something quite exciting and new. Your school becomes a case study in the Royal Commission into institutional responses into child sexual abuse. So you decide to meet some of the victims. Tell me a story about someone, a past student, whom you had to meet or chose to meet or wanted to meet. When, I, when the Royal Commission came along, I, I actually watched a documentary on ABC TV. Uh, there was obviously lots of news and media around the Royal Commission at the time. And this was a story about a Jewish school in, in Melbourne. And I watched uh, Maddie's story about how he was abused at the hands of his principal at that school and how it was swept under the carpet. And I think at that, that moment I decided that I needed to actually go to the hearings myself. I had been called to give evidence, uh, so I was on the, on the list to actually provide evidence. So I, I had to prepare a statement uh, and ready to give that, but I decided to go into every day of the hearings. And really that's probably the first time I came into contact with victims. And I, I went and I decided not to tell anybody in the room who I was and why I was there. I just sat amongst the people. Uh, there was mothers there, there were victims there from the two schools that were part of that public hearing. And I listened to their testimony. Before I went, I'd read every witness statement uh, that was provided as well. So lots of victims have provided witness statements and it gave me an insight into who these people were and what had actually occurred to them and, and the failure of the school and the organisation to keep them safe. It was an incredibly moving experience. Um, I couldn't sleep much during those times because you went home and you relived what you'd actually heard. It was horrific. There was one victim who they read, he, he read his statement. It took him an hour and a half to read it. It wasn't that long, but because it was so emotive and the first time he told his story in a public forum and told his story to people who believed him, it was just, it was you know, a harrowing experience. The moment that, you know, at the end of the Royal Commission there, I uh, was granted an opportunity to stand and actually apologise to the victims, and it, it, it opened the floodgates. And from that moment onwards, for three months, uh, three or four victims or their families were contacting me every day, seven days a week, uh, all the way up to Christmas Eve. Uh, it then stopped, had a short break, and then started again after Christmas and the New Year. Uh, five years on, I'm still meeting with victims. Uh, I was talking to a victim yesterday, a new one came forward earlier in the week, uh, catching up with another victim next week. Uh, the job continues on. Uh, one victim I particularly wanted to reach out to was a guy named Archie. And Archie was abused by the music uh, tutor who worked here in the early 80s. And Archie uh, 
coming out, they call it. He came out online on a blog, and he's an investigative journalist, a very, very clever man. And he had his own website, uh, and he was telling stories there. And all of a sudden, when the Royal Commission was announced on that website, he actually announced that he was a victim of abuse, and he told his story in a public forum. It was just harrowing. Uh, that story was picked up by another school in Brisbane. Uh, and he made accusations against the teacher who worked there, and that teacher then took his own life the very, very next day. So it was all over the media. Uh, I hadn't met this guy, uh, but everyone was petrified about what he would write next, what he would actually say. Uh, when I apologised at the Royal Commission, all the lawyers were watching his website to see what he'd actually do and how he responded. But remarkably, and I shared it in the book, he accepted the apology. And then, I was able to reach out to him online via email, uh, contacted him through his website. Um, three months later, he came back to the school for the first time in 30 years, uh, and we developed a relationship and, and went on a journey together, which resulted in the creation of a memorial at the school. Was it hard to get up and give an apology on behalf of an institution uh, when you weren't there at the time? In other words, you were basically accepting responsibility for something that had happened before your time here. Was that difficult? Strangely, no, it wasn't difficult. It was the right thing to do. And I think that comes back to your question about power, the difference between power and leadership. You know, somebody who looks at leadership from a position of power would probably say, no, that's not my responsibility. You know, it didn't happen on my watch, and therefore I don't have the responsibility or the, the need to actually apologise. But when you look at leadership through the lens of service, you're actually taking on responsibility for the organisation, for the community of people. And it's history. And it's history. And warts and all, you have to own that. You know, while I wasn't the leader at the time, it wasn't my responsibility. Nonetheless, the culture of the organisation now is my responsibility. The people, their pain that they're feeling now is my responsibility. And the right thing to do to help them on their journey was to acknowledge the mistakes that had been made and apologise for them. Was that apology as powerful as it would have been from the, the headmaster at the time? No. But nonetheless, I was representing uh, the organisation and it was an apology that was received because it was given in a way that was genuine. Uh, forgive me for jumping in, but do you think that leadership model or your idea applies to any organisation or institution or just schools who are facing this sort of scenario? The reality is any institution or organisation is made up of people. You don't have an organisation or institution unless you have people. Uh, and people thrive on relationships. Uh, it's all about relationships. So if you don't come at it from that point of view uh, and build those relationships uh, and engender that trust and accept people for who they are and value them for who they are, you will never have a great organisation. Uh, it's, it's about people, it's about relationships. So no matter where you work, what type of organisation, an insurance company, car sales, a school, you know, media, where it is, people come together and they want to feel like they belong, they want to feel like they're making a contribution, that they're making a difference, and they want to feel valued. I'm speaking with Paul Browning, he's written the book Principled, uh, 10 Leadership Practices for Building Trust. It's published by University of Queensland Press. You meet Archie some level of communication or trust is obtained uh, and as I understand it this partly results in you building a garden or a place a sanctuary on the grounds of the school that people like Archie would never want to come to tell me about this, this you, 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 as I understand it you had a specific purpose for this space on the grounds of St Paul's in other words it wasn't just words you said we actually need to have something physically here as well. I remember the first time I met Archie, you know, we'd been communicating online via email for a long time and, I, and I'd encouraged him or I asked him to meet with me and, and we went up to the pub, oh, well, we decided we'd meet at the pub at Bald Hills, uh, sort of neutral territory because he, d he didn't want to come back here. Uh, it, it was too emotive for him and too difficult. So I remember walking up there um, in fear and trepidation because I'd never met this man. People were actually quite frightened of him in terms of what he'd written online and who he might be. Uh, and I sat there, we were agreed to meet at 10 o'clock, you know, 10.30 came, still no Archie. Um, 
almost gave in when he, he arrived. Uh, Apologised for being late, a string of expletives. We sat down, we had some food together, had some drink. Um, his hands were shaking and uh, just the emotion in him was, was physical. It was just uh, quite scary. And, and from there we went on a journey and I said to him, the reason I want to meet with you, Archie, is what struck me the most at the Royal Commission was when I apologised, a victim from another school embraced me. He hugged me and said, Paul, thank you on behalf of those people who don't have a voice. Uh, and what I didn't realise, and I don't know why, but I didn't realise up until that point is the pain that, that people feel because of the abuse that was per you know, perpetrated against them it was so intense that people had taken their own lives. They'd ended their own lives. Uh, and so from there I started to do some research into the school records and went through it and I found 12 names of boys who I can't prove whether they were abused or not, but with the evidence I've got, you know, it's quite, quite likely they were. And I can't prove whether they took their own life in their own hand or whether it was an accident and how it was actually reported, but certainly there are at least 12 boys where the suffering and the pain was too much and they'd taken their own lives. So. I wanted to create a space, or I felt compelled the need to create a space that gave an eternal apology, rather than just words in a Royal Commission, a public hearing where people would forget sooner or rather later. A space that people could say, this means something to me, that would reconnect these boys, now men, back to their school. Because a lot of them actually say, I actually really enjoyed being here, it was a great school. This part I didn't like. Uh, and I hated the fact nobody believed me, I wish they did. But these parts of the school I enjoyed, but they never come back because the memories are so strong. So Archie and I worked together with his wife. Uh, we worked with a couple of other victims and their parents, uh, mums particularly. Uh, I had a couple of concept designs, I hated both of them. <laughs> I was really disappointed with that because I'd engaged an artist from QUT uh, to interpret what was going on and they said, that's, you know, that doesn't mean anything to us. Uh, and they designed and created the space and then I allowed them to build it. Okay, and so they families of victims Families designed. of victims okay. uh, and Arch and his wife, they, they designed it and they built it. Uh, and then when we opened it one night in March, uh, back in 2017, was only, the, the opening was only for victims and their families, and it was in the evening. Um, it was a really powerful night. We'd, we'd lit a candle around that space for every victim that we knew. And at this stage, 120 victims, 120 vic candles. Two candles for the victims that we didn't know about, one for the victims of the other school where this perpetrator worked. Uh, and then people just came in the night, and we sat there and we told our story, shared our story, what had actually occurred. And from then, at night, people have been coming. And still? They sit, and still, they sit there at night. If you go there, sometimes there'll be a bunch of flowers left there at night. Um, people come and it's a place of solitude, a, pl a place of reflection, and it's a place of healing. It's called the beginning of peace, and, and it has actually worked. It's, it's, you know, a guy turned up there in January this year. He came to the school for some reason dark place, he was determined to take his own life that day. Uh, and for some reason he turned up here, he didn't, it was the first time he'd been back to his school. And he came across that garden and a member of our, our staff knew about it and that member of staff took him to that space. Uh, and he decided not to take his own life. It's a powerful space. Can trust precede truth or does truth have to come before trust? That's a really interesting question. <laughs> I've reflected a lot on truth, and you probably have too, Steve. I think what is truth? Uh, truth for me comes out of my faith and who I am and what my identity is. But I think truth for everybody else is different. Like your truth will be different to my truth because you see the world differently to me. So for a victim, their truth comes out of their, their journey, their story, uh, the pain that they've suffered. It's different to my truth. Uh, and I think one thing I've, I've learnt over the years of, of speaking to victims and getting to know them, uh, the, the lesson I've had to learn the hard way in the sense is, you know, because I see the world just through my lens, truth, looking at it that way is my truth and I project that onto other people. Where 
your truth will be different. And so I, I can't judge you. I've got to accept the fact that what you see is different to what I see. And that if I genuinely listen to you and walk in your shoes, then I actually might end up being changed. My view of the world or my view of truth might be different. So truth and trust, I think trust is the key. Truth. Let me, let me put my question in leadership terms then. Is it possible to repair the p damage from the past in whatever institution if a leader doesn't take responsibility? Now, in your case, uh, and I'm going to choose a term deliberately, you repented on behalf of the previous leadership, the school, all that occurred. So repentance, in a sense, draws a line in the sand yeah. and someone, in this case you, takes responsibility. Uh, and so there's a declaration of, uh, from a leader, I'm accepting that these things occurred. They occurred while we were responsible for you, so therefore the, where to blame? I apologise, or what have you. And it seemed to me that the fact that everyone was watching whether Archie online, the, the abused victim, would accept that or not. In other words, there seems to be something very deeply hidden in any leader, or at that moment when anyone says, I accept responsibility for this something does seem to potentially change no matter what the leadership structure. I guess that's what I, what's in the back of my mind asking that. And redemption is probably the best word yeah, to, yeah. to actually use. And it, it's more than that though. You know, genuine forgiveness or uh, confession or redemption or reconciliation comes not just with ex, you know, acknowledging what you did wrong or taking responsibility for the wrongs, it's actually making sure they don't happen again. It's fixing, in a sense, the past. You know, so part of that redemptive process with the victims is to demonstrate that this school is no longer the same place as it was in the 80s and the 90s. This school now is a place that genuinely believes young people when they say this is what's happening to them, that it hears them and values them as individuals, that has put in place structures and procedures to protect children, uh, to make sure that they are genuinely cared for and they're safe when they come here, that we've actually made recompense by creating a, sp a space that is in the centre of the school that really speaks of we are genuinely sorry and we've made this a centre focus of our school and acknowledge that this is part of our story. We haven't swept it away under the carpet. And so redemption, reconciliation only comes with saying sorry, but then I'll fix what happened as Do, best I can. So does this principle apply to uh, other leadership models or other institutions? Because your book is actually about leadership, although it's in the context of, of, of this school, but you're, so you've written 10 principles, if you like, the 10 commandments for, of leadership. And I'm wondering whether that principle applies to other institutions. This is a, an Anglican school that you're the head of. So it has a, a Christian philosophy or foundation. Um, and, but that's a different model from someone whose foundation is increasing shareholder value and making profit for the organisation. Uh, or for expanding a, on the sort of the, a, a growth trajectory set by the board of directors. Do these principles, or how many of these 10 principles you've applied in the book Principled, actually apply outside of the model in which you're running? I would argue they apply to any leadership position in any context. Uh, as you read the book, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate and understand it's, it's actually not my thinking or my reflections that have gone into those 10 principles. You know, while, I t while I tell stories that support it, it's actually the result of research, a PhD project that I actually did. So reflecting on what this organisation was like, it's no longer like that now, uh, caused me to do a PhD study with the University of Queensland, uh, University of Technology. Uh, and as a result of that, a multi-case study of uh, four highly transformational trusted leaders uncovered these 10 principles. Now I chose the context of independent education, but the principle of an independent school is actually not unlike the CEO of a not-for-profit organisation. So my responsibility is, is not student discipline or, or managing the curriculum. My responsibility is risk mitigation, uh, strategic planning, uh, payroll, 
capital management, all the sorts of things that you would see in the role of a CEO. I report to a board, uh, so I'm responsible to them for my performance. So in a sense, I have shareholders and parents and, and customers there. So my role is not dissimilar to what you might find in, in the corporate world in different settings. And I come back to the point, I guess, too, that you know, what we saw in that research is actually about people. So I asked people, why is it they trust, why is it that you trust your leader? And they told me stories and every organisation has people at the heart of it. So all of us are looking for somebody that we trust. And no matter the context, no matter where you work, you're looking for a leader or a boss that you can trust, that you know they have your back, they know, you know that they value you, that they actually care for you, that when you have a problem, you'll, they'll listen to you, that they'll support you in terms of your career progression. These principles that I'm talking about here are applicable to any leadership position, anywhere, any context. Paul Browning, thank you. Thank you.